Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell. I'll be your host here tonight at the Real Science Exchange, and uh, we're here to welcome Dr. Tom Overton to further discuss the uh, webinar that he gave uh, just a couple short weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Overton joined us for the Real Science Lecture Series and presented a, an insightful webinar titled Turbocharge Your Fresh Cow Diets, and he presented that back on July 10th. You can access that webinar at balchem.com slash real science. Uh, now, Tom, we're really looking forward to uh, digging deeper into this conversation tonight. But, but first, uh, I'd like to welcome you back to the Real Science Exchange. It's it's been a minute. Um, I, you were you were part of one of the first ones, but it, it's been at least two years since you've been here. So, welcome back. And, uh, and and what's in your glass tonight, Tom? So, thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, what's in my glass is uh, gin and tonic minus the gin. <laughs> minus the gin. So, okay, that's that's fair. Now, what kind of gin would you normally have with your gym, gin oh, and tonic? Probably either Tanqueray or Bombay Sapphire or something like that. All right, cool. So, uh, Tom, I see you brought a guest with you tonight. Uh, would you mind uh, introducing your guest, and why did you decide to invite yeah, him? Yeah, so Marty Faldet um, from GPS Dairy. Again, I've known Marty a long time, and you know he's part of a very progressive group, in the, mostly in the upper Midwest, that feeds an awful lot of cows. Yeah, so Marty, really looking forward to the conversation tonight. I've heard your name forever and met several of your teammates, specifically uh, Jim and King, but I've never met you, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Uh, would you mind kind of telling us a little bit about yourself and GPS? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you again for being invited, Tom. I appreciate that. And uh, Balkan for putting this on. Looking forward to the discussion we're going to have today. Uh, GPS Dairy, we do, you know, I was telling... Uh, Scott, a little bit. We do have a uh, podcast. We call it Dairy Cast. You can just jump on it on the GPS Dairy website, and there'll be a Dairy Cast tab. You can just uh, jump on that, or you can search it through any podcast, uh, you know, uh, I guess libraries or or sources that you have that uh, will also provide it. So that's been something we've been uh, working towards in terms of our team. You know, it's a group of nutrition consultants, mainly in the Midwest, like Tom mentioned. Uh, earlier and uh, um, yeah, we work a lot in uh, different areas. I work some in Michigan, Wisconsin, Texas. Others work across Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota. We get down in Nebraska and Texas and um, try to stretch out from there. Excellent. So again, looking forward to the discussion tonight. Do want to fit my uh, forget my co-host, Dr. Jeff Elliott. Jeff, welcome back. It's always good to have you here. Uh, what's in your glass tonight, Jeff? Well, I guess in recognition of the hot summer here in Texas, having a little tequila, even though it feels a little bit early for it, but, you know, that'll help me get through this uh, podcast with Tom. I, I usually need a little help when he's around. So, and uh, just a little side note, Scott. So um, Marty and I worked together both in our previous lives. Uh, mm -hmm. When I came out of grad school, when one of my jobs, we were uh, consultants with the same company. So Marty and I go way back as well. And then of course, Tom and I were in grad school together. At wow. Illinois. So, you know, these guys, do you, do you, uh, do you have any good stories you can share? <laughs> I may have to edit all those. So <laughs> especially right. the ones on Marty. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Very well. Well, tonight, uh, Jeff, I'm having, I'm having what they call a rock Valley s that spirits. It's a single, uh, malts uh whiskey and this is uh it's it's a little local distillery they're they're starting to pop up kind of like uh, little brew pubs but uh i found it interesting this one is mashed fermented distilled and bottled by the milk family uh and it's in from long eddy new york so that's what i'm having tonight so guys as we uh discuss turbocharging your fresh cows let's first uh, toast to a great conversation this evening cheers yeah. Cheers. Right, cheers. New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, Choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition. Choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth. And choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. 
This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. So, Tom, I'm going to jump right in. As mentioned, uh, you presented on the Real Science Lecture Series back in July. Can you kind of just start us off by giving us a 30-foot uh, overview of what your presentation was all about? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is that, uh, you know, fresh cow diets aren't new by any means. And Marty can attest to that, I'm sure. But, you know, I think we've had some research to go on in the last few years that's helped us to sort out maybe some opportunities on the starch fiber side and then also some opportunities on the protein side in these fresh cow diets. And so, you know, by and large, we haven't had a lot of research to go on, but that's that's changing. And, and that then results in opportunities, I think, out there in the industry. Yeah, so you said that, uh, you know, the vast majority, right, as, as the, the research has been done on the dry cows, why not the fresh cows? Yeah, so it's interesting, and, and we're guilty of this too, is some of our program over time is that, you know, most of us transition cow researchers who are interested in nutrition, we would vary things in the dry period, right? We'd look at, uh, you know, control energy diets, we'd look at DCAD, you know, we'd look at a variety of, of, of dietary, you know, strategies and interventions during the dry period. And then after calving, we would just put the cows onto whatever diet the herd was feeding, the research herd was feeding. And so there wasn't really a whole lot of thought put into, you know, what um, what a fresh cow diet maybe should look like. And, you know, part two of that is if you're interested in lactate cow nutrition, right? Most researchers would be like, well, I don't want to start these cows until, you know, through a few weeks into lactation because I want to make sure they're healthy and, and ready to go and things like that. So we've, we've kind of had a gap there. Um, that's kind of needed to be filled. And so, you know, we, we and others have been interested in, in trying to fill that gap. So even though there's not a lot of research, a lot left to be known, uh, based on your experience, relatively speaking, how important is that, you know, three weeks after calving, how important is it relative to the dry, the dry period? Well, there's an awful lot of wheels turning in that cow um, in, that, in that first two to three weeks after calving, right? I mean, you've got you know, body fat mobilization, body condition mobilization, you've got some body protein mobilization, um, you've got, you know, potentially, in, in, you know, systemic inflammation in those cows, you know, much more so than during the, the, the pre-calving period. You know, you might have, again, you know, elevated concentrations of uh, NEFAs, non-certified fatty acids, uh, BH, you know, ketones. Um, there's just a, a calcium dynamics in that, in that fresh cow, you know, again, we're learning more about that all the time too. And so there's just, there's a lot going on there. And so I, I think it is important for us to think about how nutrition might best interface, um, and help those cows get off to a strong start from an intake standpoint. And, uh, you know, that's, that's part of what it's all about, right? These cows, you know, if they eat after calving, then, you know, good things tend to tend to happen with that. Tom, I have a lot of questions for you. I mean, we've already, as a team, discussed some of the concepts. I reached out to, uh, you know, Weston a little bit, you know, trying to understand, you know, some of that research and where you're going with it. So I, I probably could sit here and ask you questions all evening if we each had a bottle of something to uh, keep her entertained through it all. <laughs> Marty, I'm curious for you, right? Because again, I, you know, you you probably you've got some herds that you know. Let's let's go back before this information, right? I mean, you probably have had some herds that have had a high cow diet beginning at calving, right? You've had some herds you have a specific fresh diet. I'm just curious how you approach them, approach those over time, and and you know, how do you how have you assessed? Okay, is this a you know, are we winning or or not? Yeah, I think that's where. You know, for me, the research still plays a role in guiding you, you know, on what to do. And so you take that and you move it forward and you implement it on a farm and then you kind of fine tune it, trying to manage cost or manage, you know, each farm is slightly different. So a lot of times I do want to implement a four, I call it a 14 day pen. It can range from 10 to 17, but you know, I always get caught up with farms that maybe say the pen is large enough for a 30 day pen. I'm like, well, that's not a fresh pen. You know, it's just like, to me, it doesn't work. You know, a 30 day pen just is meaningless. It's it, maybe we can lower stocking rates and do a few things to make it successful, but it's just a tough pen to manage. And if I can get like a 10 to 17 day pen and really implement something, you know, that helps 
helps a lot. So now you can actually, you know, really move what you learn from the research side into this type of program and kind of give that extra advantage to that fresh animal, whether it be stocking rate and, you know, lockup times and, you know, just cow comfort, heat abatement, and then you really hone in on that diet, you know, and each, and the diet to me is, uh, I'm always amazed, like, yeah, I have what my diet would be like, but you got to fine tune it for each farm is a little different. And that always surprises me. I'm like, ah, this should work on every dang farm. <laughs> like, there should be no reason why this can't work here. And, you know, you just can't figure out why it can't. And that's the point you were making, like, some farms can just throw them right onto a milk cow diet and they take off and they're fine. Yeah. yeah. You start thinking the biology should be the same, but yeah, it's not. So Marty, can you expand, you know, you said that 30 day fresh cow pen just doesn't seem to work. Can you expand on what you mean by that? Well, I, I guess if you're trying to implement our diet, you know, that you learned that can really help out you, you can't be a, you know, you can't leave it a high fiber diet, you know, and manage some of that 30 days, you know, that animal just isn't going to probably survive. She's going to pull up a lot of energy and probably repro ain't going to be as good either. And milk's going to be a little lower, but if you could, um, you know, I like to increase the fiber. I think, you know, Tom, just like you mentioned in terms of the effective fiber in that 14 day type pen, I think it's crucial. I think if you can do that and then bring the starch along and you kind of have both parties to that diet, you can really make it work well and manage fresh cow or early removals. Uh, we look at a lot of early, early removals along with deads and that's our success rate. And usually that goes hand in hand with fresh cow problems. Yeah, I, I, Marty, I mean, I totally agree with you on your comments on, you know, kind of 30, 30, 30 day group is kind of a, a nowhere place to be, right? Because because yeah. the things that you know you might do or I might do with fiber to how to get that rumen to to transition well, um, you're clearly going to hold those cows back on their on their feed intakes in, in a group like that. You know some of the stuff that we've been doing or Trent Westoff, this has been a man here at Cornell's been doing with protein. Um, you know, you're you're not going to do that for 30 days most likely, um, but can you do it? Can you do it for 10 to 17? I think that's a, that's a good place to live. Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So Tom, you shared some research, uh, in your presentation relative to, uh, carbohydrate and, and fiber levels and, uh, UNDF. Can you talk a little bit about that? What have you found from that research? What kind of levels are you kind of recommending today? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, that has been out there both kind of in the industry and in, in the research is that, you know, when people have been arguing about starch levels in the fresh diet, you know, do you, do you keep them higher? Do you go low? Um, and, you know, what do you do with starch fermentability? And, you know, there, there's been one school of thought that clearly is, has, has been pushing for lower starch or lower fermentability. Um, and, but you look at the research results and there's all over the place. And, and so that's one area where, you know, it's like, okay, how do we make sense of this? And so, you know, we had done, you know, minor, minor Institute done some research where they got a, a negative response to a higher starch diet. It wasn't that high. It was like 26% starch in the fresh cows, um, in terms of intake of milk, you know, we did a similar study. We got a positive response, <laughs> in the higher starch diet. So how do you, you know, how do you reconcile that? And so when we started putting that together with some of the other research that's out there, you know, one of the things that was clear is that, is that the studies that were getting positive responses to uh, to more starch or more fermentable starch had more forage, had more, you know, effective fiber, you know, pick your pick your effective fiber metric that you want to look at, whether it's UNDF, PEUNDF, PENDF, I don't, you know, I don't care, forage NDF percent of, you know, forage NDF percent of the diet, you know, they were feeding higher levels of, of forage um, and forage NDF and, and seeing nice responses to more starch, um, not crazy with it, right? You know, no more than about 27% starch or so in that diet, you know, you know, a couple points higher than, you know, a couple points higher in forage NDF. So, you know, maybe running, you know, 22, 23% forage NDF, maybe 24 on the high end. Um, it all comes back to how digestible the other parts of the forages are on the farm as well, right? That's another key factor because you know, the more digestible the forages, the other forages, right? You, know, you get a combination of like a BMR corn silage, right? Really nice haylage. 
then you probably do have some opportunity for a little more chopped straw or whatever you want to put in there in that fresh diet just to keep those rumens going. Tom, I just laugh at the whole concept of, oh, you, you got to feed more straw to a fresh cow because of something you're like, yeah, it actually works better if you do it that way. You know, it's, it's just kind of mind boggling to me. It's like, no, I got to keep increasing straw as I increase in starch. And you're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense, yeah. you know. But it, it actually is real. I mean, I, I, I agree with that concept. You know, what kind of got us into this in the first place was there was some data um, out of Greg Penner's group and and showing a, a big spike in, in they had continuous pH logging or loggers in, in these cows. And they measured them at, at different time points relative to calving. And that day two to five after calving, they had a big spike in, in, in base acidosis in those cows. And so, you know, and I think that that, you know, there's been all this discussion about things that affect, you know, feed intake in this time and things like that. And I think when we're too fermentable with those diets or not enough physically effective fiber, I think we're, we're making these cows acidotic and we're throwing them off feed. And so it's all about trying to get that balance right. And it's probably going to be different for every farm because, you know, you got different forages you're working with, right? Um, different timing in that fresh group, you know, so it's, it's going to, you know, that's where, that's where, uh, that's where the talent of, of you nutritionists come into play as you work with your farms to get uh, get good outcomes. I had one of those experiences where the, the fresh pens, they have a lot of animals a week, so you can figure things out pretty fast. But it was in that scenario where the cows just were loose. And I'm thinking I got to bring more fiber in. And I, you know, pulled starch back or did some other things. And it didn't help. It actually made it worse and so i had to bring the starch back up with the fiber and then it all kind of uh you know just cleaned up it was just uh it was just an eye awakening to me just because you can see it with just a lot of animals and so when you get a lot of animals calving you can figure things out pretty fast yeah, i'm kind of curious how how much does um how the 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 cows are fed in a dry period how much does that impact how you feed them in the fresh period well, I disagree with kind of what you're what you lay down in your studies. I truly do uh, like them, Tom. I I think they got to go hand in hand. Uh, if you're close up, depend upon what you're doing with the close up is what you can do with a fresh cow. And so they kind of got they kind of kind of got to mirror each other. I, I don't think you can go one extreme and not the other, or vice versa. I, I think you get yourself in trouble. But Tom, go ahead with yeah, you no, know, no, right? We've always and you know, God, I got this. You know, I remember. 20 years ago plus, right? And I was a, was a relative youngster, <laughs> a relative. Okay. Um, you know, and you know, I would have, I would be interacting with nutritionists and they would say, this is early days of transition cow nutrition research. And they would be like, yeah, we want to keep the starch between close up and fresh, but no more than eight to 10% of the year is different. Right. And so we kind of had that general recommendation over time. I wish I could point to a piece of research that really nails that. Cause I can't. And, so, you know, and I see things vary in the field as well. Um, we still kind of make that recommendation, but with a little bit of a, yes, a recommendation, but, you know, um, you know, I'll see nutritionists and I'll see starches at 20% in the close-up diet. Um, you know, you see it work in, in different, you know, we have a recommendation, right? But recognizing that we're probably not as as research-based as I'd like to be. Um, you know, there's been a couple studies, there's been one study out of, Oba's group in Alberta that kind of took a run at it and they, you know, they actually had like, you know, better results with a high starch diet. It was, it was just kind of, it was a little bit, you know, just mind, um, you know, just confused, almost like, yeah, right. Okay. This is interesting and kind of confusing. So. Well, Tom, do you think that's where, you know, like all the work that's been done, you know, it's so hard to get that just, you know, really, um you know position right with all farms the idea of stocking rate you know feed ability feed ability feed a you know ability or you know that's uh, available on the you know and from the cow the water the cow comfort it's just all that like if you do all that you could probably maneuver a close up and fresh pen a little differently and make it work with the feeds you got versus having to just really having that honed in uh, deeper than usual. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, right? You know, I mean, diet's just part of it. And so there's so much that goes into, 
you know, I tell people that, you know, you overstock your cows, right? And, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you do on, on diet, but, you know, you know, all bets are off for that, for that, uh, you know, feed program to perform the way it should. Um, you know, we've been doing some research here, field-based research over the last you know, year or two now, really kind of drilling in on feeding management of these controlled energy close-up diets. Um, and so, you know, obviously we think about things like particle size and moisture and, and things like that. But then also uh, we've been doing um, basically look at variability along that close-up bunk on commercial dairies, right, from one end to the other in terms of particle size and relate to it. And we're finding a lot of variability on some farms. And so we haven't, we're still in the data collection mode, but um, we had a small study that we did with one of our extension educators up in Northern New York that showed actually some, you know, as that, as that variability in that particle size increased in that pre-fresh diet along the bunk, more fresh cow health issues, postpartum, poor metabolic status in those herds. And it was only 10, 10 herds in the data set. So we're, we're getting up to 50 herds, about 48 herds is working on land on this current study. We've got about 40 collected. So I don't know. I think there's things that um, things that run under the surface at the farm level that we don't always pick up on. Um, and I think that remains an opportunity on some farms. And maybe I'll ask Marty this, since you're covering a, a wide area and a lot of different type farms, is there any similarities or any problems you see across the board from Texas to Minnesota or in, in the in the logistics and the management part of it or is each farm different? Yeah, I think what Tom just mentioned is the focused area of why some places are more successful than others. It's that particle length of the straw that you're feeding and then that conditioning of that diet. So we work hard at adding water to it, uh, both sides uh, more than likely but and then that straw or whatever that forage you know is that you're working with and i always thought there was a lot of differences but i'd say what what i'm doing in texas versus michigan or wisconsin it it you know uh i've actually tried to simplify things i always thought you got to have alage in a diet or something in a close and i you you don't you know i just think you do you know it's more of my <laughs> My issue is probably the bigger issue. It's not not anything else. So I, I've just been proven uh, or challenged, let's say, to kind of open up that toolbox and probably address it and try to just really focus on consistency and managing cost. I mean, it's still a something you want to do, but if, if you don't do it right, it's going to be costly no matter what. Tom, one of the areas you discussed uh, during your webinar was also uh, the protein requirements of that fresh cow is a little bit different. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there was about 10 years ago, there was a study done in Denmark. It was a small study. They only had eight cows in the study. Um, they supplied um, additional protein by infusing it into the abomasum. So these cows had Roman cannulas um, and, you know, they infuse casein, right? So a perfect amino acid source, um, for obviously supporting milk production. And all they were trying to do was eliminate what the calculated negative protein balance was in those cows after calving. And they got a big milk response. They got a milk response of about 16 pounds per day, um, in those fresh cows. And, you know, and there's no, um, it was unusually big response. And of course, small study, right? So you got to take that into account. Um, and, you know, they'd repeated it in different ways, you know, with a few more cows, not necessarily room cannulated, um, and saw some positive results. And so, you know, that got the attention of us and a bunch of others. And so, again, Trent Westoff, who just uh, uh, finished his PhD here at Cornell, um, working with Sabina Mann, and I was on his committee, decided to go after this, decided to go after this. And so we looked at, uh, you know, kind of a control-ish, you know, level of MP and then a high level of MP before calving. So when I say control-ish, you know, we were probably targeting somewhere around 1,100 grams per day and even seeing CPS. And then the high was around, ended up being around 1,600 grams per day, a little higher than we were targeting based on intakes. And then after calving, they went on to um, either more of an industry kind of standard level of, of protein or an increment that we we're shooting for about three or 400 grams per day more. Uh, protein in that diet. And the postpartum protein really gave a big milk response. Um, not so much with the prepartum protein. Um, 
But the postpartum protein, again, Trent got, you know, I'm looking at data here, right? You know, Trent got somewhere in the range of, uh, uh, he got somewhere in the range of, you know, oh, 15, 16 pounds of milk right during the, the 21 days after calving with a high protein uh, fresh diet and had a carryover response around 11 or 12 pounds of milk over the 20 days after they all went back to the same diet. So at day 22, so that, you know, that's caught our attention. Um, and I think it's, you know, we, we certainly have dairies, nutritionists kind of, you know, playing around with us out in the, out in the field. And, and, you know, we're kind of, we're learning as we go. Um, but it's been kind of, it's been an interesting finding and, and the, the literature is pretty consistent. The cows, the cows who were fed the higher protein before calving did get a little better response to the high protein after calving, but it really wasn't much. The big effect was that fresh cow, uh, you know, protein supply. So, Tom, any speculation on the, the why behind that? Are they just more limited than we thought, or is there something that's going on? I, I think there's something going on there. I mean, of course, you know, the one thing we did, one design consideration in that study, and it's, it's important, I think, to mention it is, we actually fixed supplies of lysine methionine across the treatments before calving and again after calving. So it was so it was really looking at the, all the other amino acids, um, and because we formulated on a grams per mcal of me basis, and, and that didn't change between the treatments. So um, so we basically fixed supply of amino acids that we know are important in that time frame. And so you know, of course, a lot of those amino acids are glucogenic. Um, you know, a lot of them probably help promote you know, promote some fat, some fat oxidation in the liver. You know, I think there's also just stuff that we don't, you know, we got some data on, you know, at least on the, on the stuff that Trent looked at, didn't look like we really affected protein mobilization, which is interesting. So again, there's just, there's, there's things going on there that we just, you know, continue to, to have to try to figure out and what's going on there with, with their biology. So. Yeah. To me, it almost is like, well, protein's limited. It's tougher to feed, you know, for the animal to get the protein from her body reserves or something like that. Whereas energy, she can mobilize a few things. She can do, a, you know, adjust uh, differently. And so I, I, I guess it makes sense, you know, to me. And maybe the rumen, you know, the rumen can't produce enough uh, bacterial protein because of the intake and just the size of it. And so you're just not able to, to make that work or, Either that or the modeling programs aren't right, huh? Well, I think, yeah, no, no, no that's a fair point. No, Marty, I think that's a fair point, right? Because there's, there's no model that would that would that would predict that response. I don't think, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, you think about our modeling, our you know, for milking cows anyway. You know, those programs and CNCPS among them, right? They're all they're all based on cows and established lactation, right? And so you've got some things going on here that you know are different in that fresh cow. Um, and so, you know, it's just a matter of, of, you know, understanding that, understanding that biology, but you know, yeah, I mean, I, I just tell people, I think the models don't. Well, I love that you fixed the lysomethionine. I think that tells a, a different story. I mean, it truly does. I mean, I, I really enjoyed that part of it and I had, that was part of my question that I was going to have. So thanks for bringing that yeah, up. Yeah. I mean, there's enough in our minds, there were enough studies showing, you know, responses to methionine during transition period by itself, responses to lysine as well. And so, you know, I remember Sabina saying, I don't want to do just another methionine lysine trial. I want something, I want something different. And so, yeah, that stuff's, uh, I think we're just getting it, getting it accepted for general dairy science. So we can find it at Cornell Nutrition Conference proceedings, but it'll be out there in full form here shortly. Yeah, the other part of that question, uh, you know, that Jeff asked too, has to do with like, well, how do you still do it, but manage protein levels? Or do you have to worry about total protein in the diet? And, uh, you know, alfalfa versus maybe a grass forage, you know, and so I was just trying to, you know, the, the RUP type of or RDP, I guess it was being, you know, pretty low. And so you're like, it's just an interesting dilemma to try to formulate around that and then which way could you go like how could you, how could you do it differently but still do it the same way in terms of the result of the animal yeah i mean our protein levels weren't crazy by any means in that high diet and that high lactate diet i think they were i should pull it up i think they were like 15.4 or something like that and i mean exactly it was something so yeah. lower like what <laughs> they and, do that you know i think i think there's there's a couple things right i think our you know our school of thought here um you know, for what it's worth is, 
you know, we think that that some of the recommendations out there for RDP are, are too high, right? And so maybe maybe there's some room there to to pull that back a bit. And so and, and again, you know, we focused our our protein feeding on you know um, on some animal protein and then high quality animal protein blend and and some uh, bypass soy. You know, most of it was done with bypass soy. I think we had you know you know we did a lot of it with 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 that. That is what it took. Like I, I tried to replicate just what you did, and I think it ended up being like a seventeen point two five type of diet uh, to hit those numbers using kind of that protected bean meal soy type of thing, and you know that I don't know if there's an upper limit of you know lysine coming, you know using using your uh, animal protein type products like blood type yeah. of thing. So anyhow, so yeah, we're, you know, we're, uh, you know, we, again, we're, we're finding this literature overall to have some consistency to it, which gives you some confidence. Um, still, again, still early, I think, in the days of, of interacting with nutritionists, uh, you know, relative to, you know, people trying to implement things on farm and then, and then, uh, and then seeing, you know, seeing what they, what they think they see, right? So, you know, in our, in our case, right? I mean, if, you know, if you're going to get a response to something like this, it should be obvious in whatever startup milk metric you you're looking at, right? Whether you're looking at startups or, you know, week four milk and some of the some of the you know in some of the herd management software programs or whatever you know whatever your flavor is relative to to early lactation milk. So, um, yeah, definitely going to implement that, um, you know, on some farms and get it up and running. Uh, quick has already started on a couple and uh, that's exactly right I mean it's pretty easy to manage for you know four eight twelve type of front end week milk numbers and you know look at fresh cow metrics a lot of herds track it well and so this should be pretty easy to to see I think the one thing I'm seeing though and so with some nutritionists that interact with them is that they're actually running kind of already in between our two um, that's that's where I you know been. they're already kind of running in between right um, you know kind of our our control and our and our high treatment right so they're kind of running like in the middle and so and we don't know what that you know again you know the the old adage right you know if you have two points you can always draw a straight line right well we don't know if it's a straight line response or not right I mean you know so you know so we just have the really the two data points um, and. You know, so that that's another factor I think that comes into play, and especially if people are, are actually kind of formulating in the middle um, already. That, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that is I'm like in the middle of the close up and the middle of the fresh. You know, like I'm around a 54. If you had to put a number to it, and you know, you had a 47 to 59, and so I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I wasn't too bad off out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I, you know, again, I was seeing, you know, I, I would see, I would say in general, 51 to 54 in that, in that, in that post calving diet. So again, I realize we're, we're in the de we're in the details now, um, relative to, to things, but still. Well, thanks for putting it kind of on a dry matter intake kind of, you know, all those, uh, I think it helps kind of review it and take out the intake part of it because a lot of us have intakes all over the board and close ups and fresh, I think even across farms. I try to kind of hone in on them, but it's, they're still variable. They just are. Tom, I'm kind of curious, um, how well do we know what the amino acid requirements are of that fresh cow? Cause I'm, I, I'm wondering, you know, how, how well do we really understand the microbial flow? Uh, they're, they're eating less and I'm kind of wondering maybe do they have requirements for other amino acids that we don't normally think about for lactating cows? Yeah, I mean, nobody's really done. Uh, I mean, most of the amino acid work has been methionine and lysine and starting before calving and continuing after calving, right? Nobody's really, to my knowledge, really tried to parse that out between, um, you know, dry period only versus fresh only. You know, you, you think about some of the glucogenic amino acids like alanine, glutamine, which, you know, we normally wouldn't balance for, right? Well, nobody's really done that work, to my knowledge. Um, and so I think there are some you know, there's probably some other opportunity there to, to think about other amino acids. Hey, hey, Tom, one of the things, you know, um, I had down on my notes uh, from your, you know, your presentation and stuff, you know, that whole fiber thing, like, 
you know, sometimes I'm trying to understand like what is the, you know, you said what metric, whatever you look at, but if you could talk a little bit about that ketosis uh, challenge you had, and then, you know, we all want to flip back to the close up to rectify stuff and, you know, don't realize a lot of times it can be just in the fresh pan is the issue. You know, you don't have to even go back and change it if you haven't screwed that up and it's the same. Don't, don't screw it up. So a little story on how we got onto this thing in the first place, right? So we were, we were doing that lower high starch, fresh cow, uh, fresh cow trial. Um, and you know, we did what we usually do. We formulate our diets and, you know, we get forage samples and formulate diets and off we go. We actually had a dry period component in that also. And so, so we started calving cows, um, and we just had a train wreck. I mean, we had like, um, you know, essentially we, we had like, I don't know, like four DAs out of like seven cows on one treatment, you know. Yeah, not fun, you're saying. Not, not a fun week. Yeah, I won't so, mention the grad yeah. student's name, although if, if, if they listen to this, they'll know exactly who they are. But like it was one of those deals where it's in strong ketosis starting like three or four days after calving. And before that point, I'd be like, okay, three to four days after calving, got to be the got to be the close up diet. Got to be, got to be, yeah. and that was that was our our mindset. But you know, we had um, luckily we had a lot of data. You know, because you had the daily intakes, uh, we ran a bunch of NIFAs. Um, you know, intakes were fine. I mean, intakes were were just fine um, on target. We had some some diet analysis that tracked out. And you're talking intake and the close up was fine. Close up was fine. Yeah. Fresh cow intake sucked. Right. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Fresh cow diet. Fresh cow intake sucked. Um, and and so you know, I was like, you know, if 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 it's the dry period, then everything that we think about relative to dry cow feeding has got to be wrong because everything was like spot on. And so. So then we started looking at the fresh diet, and what it turned out was is that the uh, the we had BMR corn silage in the diet, uh, fresh diet, and then we had uh, um, we had uh, haylage in there as well as the forage base. Didn't have a lot of straw in there. I think we had like I don't know half a pound, no more than a pound, and oh, um, and uh, son of a gun, if the if the fiber digestive, we, I think we had more starch in the corn silage than what we had analyzed. We had much higher fiber digestibility in both diets and both forages. And so we simply were feeding, you know, you know, we were feeding, we were several points lower on NDF than, than what we thought we were. We were higher in starch than what we thought we were. And these cows just, just train wrecked. And it was kind of interesting is that the cows, the cows fed the lower starch diet. So the cows fed the, the high starch, diet with low fi lower than intended fiber they were they were the ones really having health issues wow. the cows fed the lower fi sorry the lower starch diet with with also the lower fiber than intended they, they still had health issues but it wasn't as bad and then um and then so we basically i mean the, everybody was i mean the grads you know everybody's screaming right the Farm wasn't happy because these cows are just a, a trek. The veterinarian wasn't happy. My grad student was like, "Oh my god, I'm not going to get a PhD," which she did. Which like, okay, you know, but just you know, everybody was. Jeff and I are going like, "Yeah, we could have got fired." Exactly. You know, we would have been. Yeah, like, how do you fire yourself, right? In this case, so but anyway, so we uh, so what we did is we're like, okay, we just don't have fiber in this diet, and so that's when we just said, okay, we're gonna. We're gonna crank a couple more pounds of straw in here, chopped, and and the, the issues went away immediately. Um, and we had we didn't have a we calved, you know, eighty cows more without a DA without a DA and almost no other health issues whatsoever. So that was kind of our kind of aha moment there. And it's it's interesting when we when we put it back together, trying to look at before and afters, which is more of a case study um, than anything else. Um, you know, again, those, those cows fed high starch and, and low fiber were a disaster. Uh, the cows fed in terms of intake and, and other parameters we looked at, the cows fed the, the, um, the cows fed the lower starch diet, regardless of fiber were kind of in the middle, but kind of to our surprise, the cows fed the combination of that higher fiber, higher starch, 
their intakes just took off better than the other than anybody else. And that's what I was hearing. I would, yeah. That's how I would see. So it, it was, was kind of it was it was we didn't expect to be there, but that's kind of how we how we got onto it. Now we we've done some subsequent work. We tried to it's not published yet, or it's published in different places, but. Uh, we've also learned that can you go too far with with pushing fiber the fresh cows and the answer to that is absolutely and you make them ketotic so you know so and that was that was another that was another mistake i'm, I'm not too proud to admit to admit uh mistakes we ended up using a kansas hay in that nothing against kansas uh but it had a kansas hay that was like 50 percent undf um it was a 39 percent ndf alfalfa hay with 50 percent of that NDF being undigested. And so we overshot, we overshot our targets on UNDF in that fresh diet. And so, yeah, we, we made these cows ketotic, uh, lower intakes, poor energy balance, more ketosis, less milk. Yeah. So when people say, Hey, when you have ketosis, what's it from? You're like, well, it could be this or it could be that, you know, it's just what we say. But I think in the field, you know, when nutrition, when we started working with nutritionists on some of this, I mean, they, they would end up, um, you know, we would end up, you know, not half a pound to a pound of straw, right? And it's, say it's a higher corn silage based diet, we might be, you know, one to two, two to two and a half, but, you know, and that's say it's like in a 42 pound dry matter pack, right? For a fresh cow or something like that, you know, so we, we would end up higher than most people would go, but, um, but not where we, <laughs> not where we were. And again, it comes back to fiber digestibility. I think we had the forages, right? So, yeah, so, but. Yeah, I mean, typically I'd say a pound is is normal, and then, you know, if you got something uh, weird you're working with, you know, I I'm not scared to go up to two pounds, but I haven't been much above two, but uh, I could understand you probably could do it, just rearrange other forages and, you know, make it work. Yeah, and again, I'm, it's not so much about just amount of straw roll. It's more probably a bit about you know how how are we complementing the other forages in the diet. Right. So, yeah, fiber dynamics. Yeah. And I mean, clearly, you know, you look at some of the Michigan State work where they got nice responses to, and we, I showed this in the webinar, where they got nice responses to high moisture corn, uh, you know, in but in conjunction with a higher forage fresh diet, those cows stalled out on intake by 10 to 14 days. And they didn't, their intakes really didn't move again until they got transitioned onto a lower fiber or lower forage fresh diet, or lower forage, I'm sorry, high cow diet, you know, so. So back to your notion where we started, right, with that 10 to 17 day fresh group, you know, 14 day plus or minus, that's probably not a bad place to live, I think, on yeah. if you can. You know, this might be a little side uh, note, but I still believe that we haven't, I mean, the far dry cow program, you know, I realize managing energy level is the key component to that. And I've lived and died by that, you know, uh, from the earlier days. I still believe we're going to figure out that we're doing stuff uh, not where it needs to be, you know, in terms of maybe the calf or, you know, setting something up a little better uh, more than just, uh, you know, maybe it's the quality of forages. I mean, we try to keep forages clean and, you know, no more are we doing any type of crappy forages to the far dry because, you know, they're, we got to get rid of it type of thing, you know, so. We're, we're doing something there and we're trying to clean it up, but I, I bet research wise, there's going to be more to it, huh? Yeah, I, I think so. Right. And we tend to, we tend to key in probably a little more on energy in the far off than we do close up. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I, yeah. Cause I, I also think it's, it's, you know, if you got a big pile of corn silage, right. It's pretty easy to pretty tempting to, to, to yeah. we're going to, you know, increase that a little bit far off. And before you know it, our, intakes are high our energy is a little high and you know i do think the, the research on keeping energies down at least for the cow right at least makes sense for the cow's intake post calving because that's pretty consistent showing you know far off energy levels controlling them before yeah. for getting the cows off to a good intake start but i agree with you i mean the, the calf you know you know are we doing anything in, you know are we doing anything in utero um you know to to that to that you know calf that's going to be born um, and we don't think we have any evidence of it. Uh, those trials generally don't show any difference in birth weight. That's only one. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, what about the, the high, uh, you know, this MP per pound of dry matter research that you just did. What about on the repro side on that front end? You know, if we get the milk, do you think the, you know, I, I don't know. Right. Um, 
come right with it, meaning better or poorer or what? Or uh, I, I would assume better. You know, if the animal is just uh, feeling, you know, performing better, I would think she's going to bring it all the way. But. Yeah, I would. I would think so, but I don't know. As we've got the, I don't think Trent's track. I don't know if we got the numbers in that trial to really look at that. So, but it's a fair, you know, it's a fair comment. Yeah, Marty, it's basically, we don't know what we don't know. And we probably will. I mean, it makes sense. I think we all consider those far off cows the least important animal on the thing. So it hasn't been research done. But then you look at the fresh cows, we're really just now getting to research with them and they're maybe the most important. Uh, so it's fun and interesting. But you made a point earlier about the bookends with fiber and starch, et cetera. So to maybe both of you, where does fat, we bring that component in with fiber and starch. How does that fit in together? Well, just, you know, I've been down that road with the research coming out to go a little higher, go a little lower, you know, back, you know, in the Wisconsin days, early coming out i mean you were told to not feed fat. i think it was barton's data right you know you were pretty much told to leave fat you know low and she doesn't need it and uh you're probably uh creating a, a bigger problem if you do um i don't follow that logic anymore i probably more around that five percent uh ether extract type fat level um uh, i do feed a couple pounds of cotton and maybe a half a pound of you know a a combo fat type of thing, you know, it's trying to figure out, well, am I going to be a palm person or a combination of different fats? You know, how are you going to do it? And so I've been down that road of all palm, no palm, you know, on this fresh diet. And, and Marty, you've got to identify yourself. You, you yeah. got to be a palm or not. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I would say I'm not a, a all palm right now, but definitely there's, there's, it's interesting, you know, Tom, it, it's, uh, I'm trying to hang in there and, and not uh, flip flop so much, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, we really don't feed any added fat pre-fresh typically. So close up. Um, and the, when I say added fat, I'm talking about. Yeah, I don't either. I was mainly saying fresh, but yeah. Fresh guy. I just look at one of our fresh diets, 4.8% ether extract. Um, I mean, we basically have like you know, six tenths of a pound of a blend of a couple of different uh, commercial fat sources. So we're, you know, half pound, six tenths of a pound. Um, cotton doesn't come, cotton doesn't come into our diets all that often here anymore. It used to come in more than it does now. I don't see cotton very much on the farm. So if we're feeding fat, we're usually doing it from commercial sources or increasingly seeing some plenish, uh, some high oleic soy beans out there or conventional so um but yeah I, I don't you know there's there are some interesting data i'd like to see a little more on some of the omega-3 fatty acids and their anti-inflammatory properties because we know that inflammation is something in the fresh cow but so that may you know we may, may we may evolve our perspective over time um a bit but for now we haven't gone crazy with fat in, in a fresh diet so so far we've talked about uh, starch fiber protein fat Anything else, Tom? Uh, do we need to pay any special attention to vitamins, minerals in that fresh cow diet? Yeah, you know, we've got a little bit of data. There's not a lot of, you know, we tend to boost, you know, like I might see in a high cow diet, and more to comment here, I mean, calcium's around 0.8 or 0.9%. We tend to feed a little more calcium than that to a fresh, you know, like 1.1 1 .1 or something like that. Um, I would see herds transitioning from like a higher magnesium pre-fresh diet around 0.45 down to like 0.3. That seems like a big, you know, magnesium is important in calcium metabolism. So we tend to boost that a little bit too, um, you know, maybe to point, maybe to point, point four, you know, something like that. Um, we played around with some of the commercial sources, um, you know, and, and, you know, I don't have kind of more anecdotal than anything else, um, you know, but yeah, those are probably be the big things. I mean, you're going to cover your base with your vitamin E's and things like that as well in that fresh cow diet as well. But, you know, not nothing nothing major from my standpoint beyond that. I mean, Marty, what your perspective is as somebody who lives, this, lives and does this every day? Well, I think the protected choline's right, you know, being 
you know, reassure being on top of the list for sure uh, in terms of what you're doing. And, you know, in terms of uh, chromium is kind of finding its way into diets for me uh, with some of the research and what they're doing and the cost coming down. So it just feels like you can, um, you know, the return is uh, a little bit better. Um, you know, and yeah, in terms of minerals, I guess I work a little potassium, a little higher, probably use potassium carbonate to do it type of concept, you know, a kind of hydrated potassium carbonate a source more than potassium chloride. Um, so I, I do kind of work that a little bit, but I keep up. I looked at kind of your specs and what you did and I would support a lot of it. So. Yeah. And the, it, mm. yeah, I wasn't thinking choline, but yeah, the meta analysis of the choline is, is solid relative to production, production responses and things like that. So it's got a nice body of literature there. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you on that. I go to a lot of these dairies and they can be large dairies too. You say, do you have a fresh cow pen? Yes, we have a fresh cow pen. Do you do you have a separate fresh cow mineral or premix? And most of the time they don't. They're feeding one to all of them. So the so the I guess the dilemma is how do we get those extra vitamins and minerals? If you want to feed some choline or something else, how do you get that in there? Um, have you found that to be true, Marty, when you're going to these dairies? And well, when you get the micro machines or you get some other fine mixes, you can get it implemented, you know, into a fresh pen. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying. I think that is the dilemma on how you influence that fresh cow diet. You pretty much got to have some kind of a fresh cow mix, fresh cow. I don't know. People call it a pack or something. I usually have fresh cow mixes that are separate so I can really hone in on the things we talked about today. Um, and so you, you get, yeah, you gotta get, you gotta have a, a different mix, you know, using the milk cow, you know, uh, using the milk cow protein mix to, to go into that. It happens sometimes and you get forced to do it, but it, it isn't, the, it isn't helping the big, you know, the big performance or big solution and what we talked about today. Well, I don't know if you guys noticed, but they did flicker the lights. That means it is last <laughs> call. Um, what I'd like to, uh, for each of you guys to do is just kind of give us a couple, a uh, couple, three takeaways from today's conversation, you know, whether it's a cons for a consulting nutritionist, dairy farmer, or, or, or a student out there. So, uh, take your pick, uh, Jeff, would you mind if I start with you on that? The economics of feeding Reassure precision release choline. Reassure is fed during the transition period, and because it's fed for such a short period of time, it costs just $15 per cow, and yet the benefits will continue to generate income throughout the year. Cows fed Reassure produce five pounds more colostrum, which pays for your Reassure investment on the very first day of lactation. Cows fed Reassure also produce five pounds more milk per day, every day. That means after the first day, Every day is payday. Invest in Reassure during the transition period and recoup your investment on the very first day of lactation. After that, you got it. Payday. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's great hearing from Marty and Tom, of course. You know, I think my big takeaway, especially after hearing these guys talk, was historically the research or we've talked about starch by itself or what should the fiber be or should we feed fat or not feed fat or and where should the protein be? But a lot of this conversation was we need to be thinking about them all together and they influence each other and where do they need to be? Um, to me, that's that's something we need to think about rather than thinking about them as individual components. Yeah. Great comments, Jeff. Marty, you've been a great guest. Uh, I really appreciated uh, having you on today. Great questions, great conversations. So, so thank you for that. And uh, would love to have you back again sometime if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Absolutely. But uh, do you have any, uh, yeah. Do you have any final comments for us? Well, I think it, it stems off of what Jeff just said is kind of no, it, for me, it's just know what your targets are, like what really works for you and just hone in on it and know your bookends, um, you know, that Tom kind of talked about on some of the fibers and starches. I mean, there's ranges you can be in, but 
know what works and, you know, implement it well. Yeah. Excellent advice. Tom, final words. Yeah, I think, again, I think, you know, over time, we're going to be looking really more at this fresh diet as its own thing, right? Rather than, okay, I've got a high cow diet. I've got a protein mix. I'm just going to tweak a few things and, and call it good. I think it's going to be its own thing. And, and I think getting our minds around that relative to how we implement that on farms, you know, consistently and well, I think is, is, is going to be important. So thanks for having me too. It's been fun to, to interact with you guys today. Yep. 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 Thanks for coming along guys and spending some time with us. It's been a great conversation. And I just want to thank you. Also want to thank our loyal audience for coming along with us once again. I hope you learned something. Hope you had some fun. And I hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. Mm -hmm.